gentlemen, I'm coming to you live from the grid above a theater. Now, if you don't know what that is, that is a place where all the wires and things all come together and you can drop overhead microphones or chandeliers on a guy if you don't really like them. But you know, so I am currently about six and a half stories above the ground, which is the perfect place to introduce tonight's you know, scary stories to introduce tonight's event. But maybe we need a little bit more mood lighting, so follow me. Hi, I'm your host, Patrick Smith, and this month we're going to be going through some of the scariest movies you've seen. Some I've seen before, some are brand new to me. Regardless, we're going to go on this journey together. And you know what? It's pretty dark and stormy out there. And the weather outside is pretty frightful. So you know what that means. It's time for October Nights. Sweet dreams. Since I'm stuck in a little bit of morning traffic, I thought I would go ahead and do this. It is October 1st, 7.08 a.m. I'm coming to you from Birmingham, Alabama, and I'm gonna be talking about our first film today. I'm very excited about that. And if I'm looking around, it's because I'm in traffic and trying to make a turn. So today we're talking about our first film uh, for October nights, and that is James Wan's new horror film, and horror is kind of an interesting term here, but it, it is definitely at least that. Um, James Wan's new film, Malignant, which is currently in theaters or on HBO Max uh, in the ad-free plan. I say that in case you want to check it out without leaving the confines of your house, um, just because I want to be nice. Uh, but this is one of those films that actually made me want to go back to the theaters. I did watch it through HBO Max, um, mostly because I wanted to watch it with a friend, and we live about, I don't know, 180 miles apart, so that was the easiest route to take, rather than trying to find a theater in the middle that would accommodate both of us, uh, and would fit both of our very, very busy schedules. Um, so, Malignant was something that I definitely wanted to see, because I'm a big fan of James Wan's work. Um, I saw Saw just a couple years ago uh, and really, really liked it. It's an amazing little film that can, that you would be kind of surprised that it's it's a super low budget movie that actually through uh, clever and unique editing style, uh, as well as, um, you know, a, a complex and interesting mystery story, it's actually pretty interesting and, and uh, really well crafted, and I'd argue that Saw is probably even a great film. But it sadly got lumped in with the, the torture porn genre, which admittedly, even the second installment of that franchise becomes that. Um, and it's not like torture porn's a bad subgenre, it's a very interesting subgenre in horror. Um, it may not be something that you personally can handle, but the original Saw largely is pretty bloodless. Now, sure, there is some violence, but most of it's off screen. This is a very, very tame movie. Uh, it's mostly in terms of suggestion, much like Texas Chainsaw Massacre did back in the 70s, as well as uh, clever framing that keeps the violence just slightly off screen. Uh, and, and obviously language. This is still a very intense film and with a lot of very adult characters, so uh, the adult themes and language abound here. But I do think Saw is a deeply compelling film. The cop slash mystery plot is very intriguing. Um, the wild editing style that comes out of uh, either not having enough coverage and needing to find a way to cleverly um, convey the, the manic uh, energy of trying to escape a trap like uh, Jigsaw puts together, it's kind of amazing. 
and the way that they pulled it off is super cool. Um, I personally own all of the, the Saw movies on Blu-ray right now, um, but I'm, I'm kind of considering buying uh, the original Saw on 4K Blu-ray because it's such a great film, at least in my mind. Torture porn, though, I do want to briefly address here because I don't have a ton of spaces elsewhere to do it, uh, and we don't really cover torture porn films on uh, Movie Club. Um, and so this is the perfect avenue to, to talk about it briefly. Torture porn is a horror subgenre that erupts out of uh, early 2000s um, kind of despair and having your entire worldview shaken up. Torture porn is kind of birthed out of um, New French Extremity as well as uh, a response to the uh, September 11th 2001 attacks on the World Trade Center here in New York, uh, in America. Uh, those terrorist attacks uh, completely reshaped culture. Uh, obviously, there were tons of films that either fetishized the event or, you know, actually paid tribute to it in a, a tasteful way, but largely um, it, it stirred America into a fervor where anybody um, that looked Muslim adjacent suddenly had a much harder life because they were trying to deal with what was happening uh, and, and the fact that people were now mad at people that looked like them. Um, and I, I use that in quotes. You can't see that because it's too far off frame. Um, and so people who were in the sick community um, were also uh, being persecuted for something they didn't do. I mean, Muslims didn't do this. It's Muslim extremists. Just like Christian extremists cause radical terrorist violence here in the States. Uh, it, it, these aren't real religious people. These are, these are people who are justifying their terrible, terrible beliefs through the guise of faith and religion. Uh, and it's, it's terrible what they do. It obviously completely shapes, reshapes American culture and culture at large because this was a huge event worldwide because this is kind of the first of its kind anyway. Uh, at least a terrorist attack on this level um, from a, a foreign attack on, on homeland. And so it, everyone started to react to it and nowhere more did they tap into that, that newfound anxiety and fear that came from those attacks than horror. Horror was no longer willing to sit on the sidelines and just be like, ah, yes, the world is still as it always was. No. Horror is going to completely admit that things are very, very messed up and they're not going to let you go quietly with it. They're going to express this newfound violence in a way that uh, some people might deem tasteless and some people might deem fetishizing of the violence, but I think is a critique of how Americans have become, you know, uh, desensitized to it. And it's also, you know, a reaction to the torture we did on people uh, to try and get information on Osama bin Laden in light of these attacks. Now, there are plenty of documentaries that could describe the impact of 9-11 a lot better than I can. Uh, Michael Moore's fantastic documentary, Fahrenheit 9-11, is definitely in that camp. Um, uh, but you can also look at news reports about how uh, comedian John Stewart has had to go to Congress to fight for a bill to uh, help um, first responders to 9-11, uh, to the World Trade Center attack, uh, with their medical bills in light of the fact that they have, like, in at that attack, at that site, they inhaled all the particulates that were coming down from the buildings um, and from all the debris, and it's caused cancers, lymphomas, and all kinds of other different diseases that have taken a lot of them way too soon. These are first responders who, in the darkest hour of America, actually um, stood, uh, stepped up and, you know, took a bullet for us. And now they're just asking that we help them, you know, pay to get that bullet removed. And uh, our Congress people continuously fail in that department. And it's one of the most depressing and egregious and vilest acts I've ever seen. So horror's never been one to shy away from violence, but it's definitely not gonna shy away from violence in the torture porn subgenre. And even then, I think torture porn is designed as a term to make things seem worse than they actually are and make it just seem like, oh, they're just doing violence for 
violence sake, and I was just turning off the uh, windshield wipers because the mist is now off my car. Um, but they want to, it, it's another term that's designed to just dismiss horror, dismiss this subgenre because it's not worthy of our attention. Okay, I'm back with my dramatic angle in the steering wheel, like right in front of the camera. But yeah, 9-11 was a huge impact to both the genre of horror and the way that Saw ended up coming out, specifically the, the way the rest of the franchise ended up. Um, but torture porn is just yet another genre that, you know, people can throw horror in, a subgenre of horror that people can just be like, ah, we don't have to critically discuss that or, or reckon with that and why it exists. That would be, you know, our jobs. Um, so I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say what needs to be said about it. Um, you don't have to like the subgenre. I'm never insisting that you have to like anything that I, I do on Movie Club or here. I, I just and think that context is important. Sometimes context might make you appreciate something that otherwise you would have hated. And so it's important to me to try and give you that, that context so that way you can understand what's going on in the world of cinema that might create a film that maybe you don't like, but maybe it will help you appreciate the artistry behind it more. That's my goal, and that's my goal, especially during this month of October nights, where we'll be covering a bunch of horror films. I want to convey that these matter critically, these matters uh, to the canon of film. They're important, and to like throw them away, I, I think is ridiculous. It's 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 uh, it's a failure in terms of actually doing a job of film criticism. Coffee burps in the morning, you know. But if, if that had been all that Juan had done, just saw, his, his impact on horror would have been incredibly important and something that we need to reckon with when it comes to talking about his body of work. But he didn't just do that, he did several other films like Dead Silence, um, and then in the 2010s, he started a franchise called The Conjuring, which is still going to this day, and got several careers uh, kind of off the ground, including that of screenwriter Gary Dauberman, who is one of my current favorite screenwriters, who co-penned the screenplay for the two It films, several of The Conjuring movies, and is currently working on his adaptation of the fantastic Stephen King novel, Salem's Lot, which we'll be covering the original adaptation from director Toby Hooper later in the month. Dauberman has, I think this is his second directorial effort. His previous one was uh, one of the Annabelle movies, but the good one, the one that's like kind of a throwback to like a 90s horror. It was a lot of fun, really cool. Um, yeah, so Juan's work on the Conjuring movies kind of reshaped what that era of horror was going to be and now in the 2020s it's kind of all over the place there's not really one set subgenre that is big right now which is awesome because it means we get a lot of variants and a lot of different kind of um, a, a different kinds of, of horror films which is important it's great and so I remember where I was when I first saw the first Conjuring film and that was in, in the theaters, and my, my friends um, ha had said, Let, let's go see The Conjuring, and I was like, absolutely, love horror movie, let's go. Uh, and then I got there, I bought my ticket, I got my seat, and was like holding down a row for everybody, and then they were like, okay, I can't make it, but hey, my, my, a couple of my friends still can, it's like, awesome, uh, I'll love to hang out with them. And then, um, slowly as the night went on, and we got closer and closer to, to movie time, um, more and more people disappeared until uh, I was there by myself and I was that guy who had like held off a row just for himself. Uh, luckily it was a packed house so it ended up filling in and I had a great um, couple people next to me. But I got to see The Conjuring all by myself pretty late at night. It was a lot of fun with an incredible audience um, and it's an exceptionally well made movie uh, and just proves that James Wan's style is ridiculously important. Uh, James Wan has now expanded into even making superhero films with the fantastically campy and awesome Aquaman starring Jason Momoa. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's totally worth checking out. It's got uh, all of his trademark style, but it's a superhero film and it's still got a couple little horror elements. It's a lot of fun. I love when 
uh, previous horror directors um, head back, at least in their, their bigger budget uh, mainstream films, and have their moments of horror, like Sam Raimi's uh, kind of Evil Dead uh, sequence in Spider-Man 2 when Doc Ock wakes up on the table when they're trying to remove the, the arms. So cool. An amazing sequence, and it proves that Raimi is still a talented horror director, and I can't wait to see what he does next in, uh, in, in horror um, for the Marvel series with the new Doctor Strange movie. I genuinely am so excited about that. Um, Conjuring, huge. Still a huge franchise, huge money maker. Um, and I think this was where uh, Juan was like, hey, I've made you guys like several billion dollars off the Conjuring movies, you're welcome. Uh, I want a blank check and I want to be able to make whatever kind of wild idea I can come up with. And that wild idea is malignant. Okay, it is now 3.55 p.m. in the afternoon on October 1st. Um, yeah, this is not, well, I was not expecting to have to shoot this in multiple takes, but uh, today's been interesting in terms of traffic and other nonsense. So, because I've done a long convoluted uh, intro to kind of give you context of James Wan's career and why uh, we're at the point now where he gets, where he's pretty much getting to do whatever he wants to. Um, I guess the biggest thing I should contextualize here is that this is kind of a mishmash of genres. And I think James and Chelsea of the Dead Meat Podcast nailed it when they said this is kind of James Wan parodying his own uh, body of work, but obviously loving. It's a send-up, you know, um, of his own work. And so there are shots that are uh, totally comical but are replicating previous style elements from his other films. Um, and it's done so in a way that is extremely tasteful. Like it, it, it knows what it is and it leans into its ridiculousness. Uh, and part of that ridiculousness is it's very like 90s-esque. Uh, it's kind of a 90s throwback to that era of horror. Um, pretty tongue in cheek and stuff like that. But it's also kind of a giallo film, sort of. Uh, and if you don't know what giallo is, it's an Italian film uh, subgenre of horror. Uh, ta uh, giallo means yellow, uh, and it effectively comes from the, the fact that these are like adaptations of lurid tales of murder and violence and sex and greed, uh, and those tended to be uh, in, in books that were bound with yellow covers um, to kind of, you know, set them aside, set them apart. So giallo is a term, is a reference to that, but even if uh, you you have somebody tell you what a giallo film is, there's a ton of people who will disagree with that definition. Uh, the giallo people are very, very particular about what they call uh, giallo. In fact, in previous episodes of Movie Club, in fact, in previous episodes of Movie Club, I've actually called the movie Suspiria a giallo film, which um, I've learned that's not the case. Uh, not really. It's not really considered a giallo film, and that in retrospect makes more sense, but Giallo is typically kind of a murder mystery. It's very campy. Uh, its dialogue is very over the top. Um, it's kind of all over the place. So Giallo films typically, like I said, are, but these films also typically include uh, a masked murderer who is usually, usually wearing very black leather, dark clothing, like a giant, um, jacket, gloves, and usually kills people with a knife uh, that isn't necessarily a uh, mandatory component, but it's one of those qualifiers that is often present. Um, so like I said, Giallo is very loosely ill-defined. Uh, it's one of those things where like, um, I don't remember what senator it was, but uh, when arguing about pornography, he said, I don't know how to define it. Uh, and obviously this is me making up a version of this quote. I don't know how to define it, but I know it when I see it. This is kind of how it is for Giallo, but even within the Giallo camp, there is a bit of infighting as to what can, what is technically a film that is part of that and what is not. So just know it's kind of nebulous and hard to nail down, but this is a film that 
is at least playing with some of the giallo elements. Uh, it is very campy. The dialogue is over the top. And every person in this film that is, is performing, every actor on, on, on screen, knows the assignment and does it well. And that is critical to making a film like this work because it is so tongue-in-cheek and it knows what it is. And it's, it's so... Uh, invested in being what it is and kind of being just an absolutely insane uh, film that it really works, at least for me. I know this has divided some people, especially people who don't have the proper context going in. Uh, I knew it was going to be at least a little bit silly going in, and I'm glad I did because it helped me set my expectations appropriately. And so... I really don't want to say any more other than, you know, Annabelle Wallace, who is kind of the, the lead of this film, does an amazing job. Uh, her face acting and everything that she has to do, especially in the more insane scenes uh, where she's uh, either experiencing what the killer is doing in real time through some pretty interesting sci-fi stuff. Um, that. That is super cool, and the way that she, you see that transformation happen on screen is, is amazing. She's great. Um, but that's about all I can say about this movie without spoiling it. So, as of right now, I'm going to be spoiling uh, major parts of the film, so if you don't want spoilers, I would suggest you stop. And if you are typically one of those people that's like, I'm fine with spoilers, spoilers are cool, I don't really care, stop it. Stop it. Get some help. Just stop the video, go watch the movie, then come back because I have some things to say. Please, this is one of those few movies that you really don't want to spoil for yourself so that way you can experience the wild ride that you're going to go on in real time. Uh, and I would also suggest watch it with friends. It's still, I think, on HBO Max right now. Uh, subtitle me will clarify that down here. Um, so if you're seeing this, check it out. Get on Zoom, watch it with friends. It's an insane movie. I'm glad I watched it with friends because I got to have a kind of a real-time uh, audience component that was super awesome um, and that I've been desperately missing this past year. So this is one of the ways that I've, I've been able to, to build that back up. So I, I mean, I knew that the title had to mean something and Every, title, every word, every title has to mean something when it comes to a movie. Otherwise, it's kind of an arbitrary choice. And so I was curious as to how this particular uh, title ref like referred to the main arc of the story. And I was pleasantly surprised at how absolutely insane this movie got. Because uh, this film is largely about a killer by the name of Gabriel, infecting our main character's life, played by Annabelle Wallace. Um, and she she's just gotten out of a abusive relationship after her husband, partner, uh, was brutally murdered in their house that they share together. Uh, but not, not, at, not before uh, he slams her into a wall because um, she keeps miscarrying his children. Yeah, it's a lot. Uh, so if you're kind of, uh, if if domestic violence is triggering for you, you might want to skip this film. As campy and as fun as it gets, there are some pretty dark elements still here too. So there is some horror stuff in here. This is a real horror movie at times. But uh, yeah, largely this is a campy fun film, but it does briefly dip into some darker subject matter. So if that's not something you uh, can handle, don't watch it, do yourself a solid, please uh, be careful. Um, I'm going to try my best throughout the remainder of October to keep um, these kinds of things in the description or let you know in advance so that way you can avoid movies that uh, would be um, bad for you to watch. I want to take care of you as best I can as we go through all these movies. And as much as I may love every single film on this list, um, some, of whom I, some of which I haven't even seen yet, I, I want to protect you as we go through this. So obviously there will be the spoiler-free section at the top and then the spoiler se uh, section in the kind of towards the end bit uh, and then a wrap up at the end. But 
it's very important to me that you feel safe here. So, uh, yeah. Okay, it is now 12.04 in the morning of October 2nd, so obviously this video did not get out on time. Um, I don't think that's going to be an issue with the next couple, so <laughs> yeah, uh, since I'll be pretty free this weekend to do what I want to um, and get you know, a little bit more prepared for the videos that are coming up next week. Uh, thank you for your patience. Hopefully this still works uh, well for you. But to wrap up what Car Patrick was saying, um, the, I think the thing that's so compelling about this film is that the big twist of it ends up being, this is kind of uh, tying back into the discussion I was starting, but you know, my ADD brain got distracted. Our villain and our main character were actually born conjoined twins. Uh, and there's a fancy scientific term that I can't remember right now. Um, but effectively, our main character had the full body and her twin was just kind of latched onto her on the back with not really any body other than just some weird uh, limbs. And uh, her twin was actually extremely violent and had the ability to do some kind of telekinesis and uh, stuff like that. Like I said, this film is very campy and fun and very silly, but it does delve into some darker territory. Um, so the scientist, because her twin is so violent uh, and wants her to live like a pretty normal life, they uh, get rid of all the ex excess limbs and then push uh, the remainder of Gabriel back into the skull of our main character. And that uh, villain character, that Gabriel, lies dormant for years until he's resurrected when the husband partner pushes our main character into the wall and she cracks her skull open at the beginning of the movie. That's when Gabriel comes back into the picture. Uh, but the cool thing is like they, they managed to keep you kind of guessing for a long time. And I think the only reason I got it as early as I did or guessed it as early as I did is because I have taken screenwriting courses so I kind of knew where they were going and saw the little, uh, little little Easter eggs and little things that were being uh, threaded throughout so that way you could on a, a rewatch be like ah yeah there's there's the proof that that's what's happening um, but what's really cool is there's a very different physicality between our main character and uh, the, the villain Gabriel. Gabriel is using the body effectively completely backwards um, and so Gabriel moves in a weird jerky way uh, and contorts the body in, in ways that are unnatural and inhuman. Uh, it's super interesting because once you understand what's happening, you actually realize that our main character has been doing all these things, but her brain has kind of just been uh, taken over by Gabriel. And so she just does, she doesn't even realize that she is uh, a part of these situations because Gabriel's able to kind of flood her brain with uh, nothing but lies. And it, it really explains some of the crazier sci-fi elements throughout the film because it does try and land somewhere in between light sci-fi and more realistic stuff. But, you know, it's a James Wan movie. It's pretty out there. Uh, but I, I love the twist and I love the story and I really love the characters and I think it's what makes this film such a fantastic watch. I can't wait to rewatch this after I get through this month of uh, uh, watching a new horror film every single night so I can actually revisit some films uh, after a while. But I definitely wanted to come on here and wrap up that discussion. Um, regardless, thank you for joining me for the first night of October Nights. Tomorrow night, or I guess... Uh, you'll see this today as well um there'll be a new video on the uh netflix film night books which is a pg rated uh kind of kids horror but it's actually really good it's really adorable it has a great message and it really resonated with me so i wanted to talk about it a little bit um that episode will be a lot shorter than this because there's not nearly as much context to tie into 
but uh, thank you for joining me for the first episode of uh, October Nights. I'll see you tomorrow for Night Books. Yeah, I'm very excited. Thank you for joining me. I'll see you all uh, in just a couple hours, I guess. Um, I'm going to cut this and edit this uh, so that way it can go up within the next half hour. Thanks so much. See you guys very, very soon.